In another attempt to have OMS Senpai notice me, we'll be doing High Fleet Crack and End, more importantly, the Second Tyrannic War. So let's begin. The evasion began 250 years after the First Tyrannic War and the destruction of High Fleet Behemoth by the Ultramarines and the Imperial Navy at the Battle of Macrog in 745 of the 41st millennium. An armed presence had been maintained in the Galactic Southeast, which officials of the Imperium's Adeptus Administratum began to question the need for, arguing that Bohemond had been the sum total of the Tyranid species, expansion into the Milky Way galaxy. When worlds along the eastern fringe of the galaxy began to erupt in rebellion, terrorism, riots and sabotage, the same adepts claimed the people were dissatisfied with living amid an armed camp. The Inquisition's Ordo Hereticus became suspicious of the adepts' descent and their downplaying of the situation on the eastern fringes, and began an investigation which established that all of the dissenting adepts had either come from the southeastern region of the galaxy or had traveled there at some time. This was the only link between the members that could be found, and some had never even met each other. Inquisitors were also deployed from Talsa Prime to investigate the planet of the Ultima Segmentum that were, more, that were most troubled. Purges were made within the Imperium, especially on Terra, focused on suspected traitors of the Emperor within the Administratum who had contact with the afflicted regions of the Eastern Fringes. Tens of thousands of suspected traitors were sent to prison colonies and the Astra Militarum's penal legions by the Inquisition. Yet by the year 990 of the 41st millennium, High Fleet Kraken had already sunk its tendrils into the galaxy, isolating many Imperial worlds before any astropathic warnings could be sent. High Fleet Bohemond had fought in a single wave that had advanced across the galaxy as a single organism. But the Kraken was actually a series of smaller, separate Tyranid High Fleets that moved to attack many human settled planets simultaneously. This not only increased the difficulty for the Imperium's defenders in opposing the High Fleet, but also increased the area of the Hive Mind's psychic shadow in the warp tenfold. Almost overnight, an entire Imperial sector was silenced from Terra, isolated from Astropath's messages of warning by the potent power of the Hive Mind. Only several solar months after High Fleet Kraken's onslaught had already begun, did the first few survivors' accounts of the attacks begin to reach the wider Imperium due to the terrible turbulence in the warp. Whole planets had been wiped out by the Tyranids in only a few hours and the Imperium of Man once more faced unimaginable threat. Icar IV Rebellion But before the true threat revealed itself, the Imperium had first faced uprisings on its eastern fringe that served as the prelude to the main Tyranid threat. One such rebellion occurred on a hive world named Icar IV. Icar IV was vital to the operation of the eastern fringe as its huge manufactoria formed the center and linchpin of one of the few densely populated imperial sectors in the widespread Ultima Segmentum. The entire planet had been seized from the control of the Imperium by a religious fundamentalist group named the Brotherhood. Years before, the Brotherhood had captured the hearts and minds of the population of the planet by preaching the return of the Emperor in physical form and promising better times to come. This is the sort of promise that was sought by the workers of the Ikaran Manufactoria, because they lived lives with no power, hope of betterment or freedom. The Brotherhood quickly set up missions and chapels throughout the poor regions of the planet. The Ecclesiarchy closely monitored the Brotherhood for any sign of corruption or heresy, but none could be found. Eventually, permission was sought and granted for the construction of a Brotherhood Cathedral in Lomas, the biggest city of Icar IV. Shortly after the completion of the Brotherhood's Cathedral, the trouble began. The Brotherhood refused to pay its ties to the planetary governor and would not allow its members to be inducted into Icar IV's planetary defense force. 
The Brotherhood, preachers, wiped the Ikaran population into a frenzy, proselytizing that the emperor would return in the flesh soon. Brotherhood militias began to roam the streets, punishing anyone they deemed to be unbelievers rather than actual criminals. Events accelerated when rioting broke out during a mass demonstration outside of the great cathedral in Lomas. Arbiters of the Adeptus Arbites moved in with power moles and suppression shields to put down the rioters forcefully, but were fired upon from the cathedral by Brotherhood militia. The arbiters returned fire and killed several of the Brotherhood's militia members. This only enraged the mob further and they surged forward several times, eventually forcing the arbiters to fall back, especially as another, larger mob had just arrived to support them. Rioting then spread across the planet and most of the forces of the Arbites were forced back. When the planetary defense force was called in to restore order, most members of the force rebelled and joined the ranks of the Brotherhood. Eventually, news of the assassination of the planetary governor reached the public and vicious fighting broke out in all of the hive cities on the planet. Within solar hours, tanks decorated with the revolutionary banners of the Brotherhood were seen driving down the roads in cities, pushing the Arbites back. With the dawn, news of the assassination of the imperial governor and most of his ministers had spread over the entire planet and the Brotherhood quickly seized control of several broadcasting stations, announcing the establishment of their new theocratic state in the name of the returning god-emperor. The Arbites still held control of the majority of the Aikaran countryside, and the Arbites precinct fortress that guarded the center of Lomas. Most of the cities had been captured by the Brotherhood, denying the Arbites vital resources. Inquisitor Agmar of the Ordo Xenos arrived 27 solar days after the rebellion began. On the same day that the Arbites fortress in Lomas was overrun by the Brotherhood's forces. Most of the judges in the fortress escaped, moving to take control of the four main power stations in the city. Inquisitor Agmar saw this as much more of an organized rebellion than a sporadic outburst of popular religious feeling. He called for the support of the Ultramarines chapter of the Astartes to help the forces of the Imperium retake the planet. While the remaining Imperial forces waited for the arrival of the Ultramarines, they bombarded the rebel cities and pushed back vicious assaults by the Brotherhood's militia battalions. Repeated attempts to reach the power station of Almas failed, and six days after Agmar arrived, the Arbites detonated several motobombs completely destroying the generators. Now the war transformed into a long, grinding campaign of urban combat, with casualties spiraling upwards daily. Every doorway could possess a booby trap, and there were Brotherhood snipers in place all over the renegade-held cities. Entire Astra Militarum patrols that remained loyal to the Imperium disappeared without trace in the chaotic maelstrom. The rebellion promised to be a long one as the Brotherhood held the armories of the Imperial Guard regiments assigned to the planet and had the support of the majority of the Ikaran population to draw on to become soldiers in its militias. Inquisitor Agmar led several small forces of Imperial Guardsmen and Ar Arbitators into Lomas to uncover the true nature of the Brotherhood. He was slowly piecing together the story when, in a chance raid, he slew a neophyte hybrid of the Brotherhood and saw what matter of Xenos creature was actually leading the revolt. Foul tyrannid gene stealers. The Brotherhood was in fact a gene stealer cult. Akmar sent an astropathic message confirming his fears of, other tyranid, of another tyrannid invasion to the Inquisition and awaited the arrival of the Ultramarines. 39 solar days after the Icarian Rebellion began, the Ultramarine's battle barge Octavius entered orbit above Icar IV and deployed its drop pods. The planetary defenses were largely inactive due to the damage to the power generators of Lomas, and as such the Space Marines landing casualties were light. The Space Marines secured the Astra Militarum's armories 
and the imperial governor's palace and fought off several poorly organized counterattacks, causing massive casualties among the Brotherhood's forces. Outside, the remaining Imperial Guard forces launched coordinated attacks to link up with the Ultramarines, using their Lemon Rus main battle tanks as moving strong points, and slowly, inevitably, the Brotherhood's lines bent back. More than 20 veteran Marines in Terminator armor from the Ultramarines Elite First Company teleported into the Great Brotherhood Cathedral in Lomas and destroyed the cathedral's defenders after Agmar sent message to Doctavius via spy satellite. More guards appeared from side doors and a storm of last beams and auto shells ripped out, massacring many of the Brotherhood guards, but not before several of the Terminators were dragged down. The Terminator's single heavy flamer proved to be invaluable, its flames in incinerating the unprotected assaulting forces. Yet some of the Brotherhood neophytes were striking out with inhuman speed and terrible claws, indicating their Xenos heritage. The Terminators then spread out and searched for the myriad of secret passages that they presumed existed beneath the Brotherhood Cathedral. They soon found out one under the altar, and the altar was quickly removed. As they moved down into the crypt, they heard the clattering of claws on stone. As the creatures jumped into the lights of the Ultramarines, they were identified as gene stealers. This showed the Inquisitor's belief that there was a gene stealer cult at the heart of the Brotherhood's revolution, to be correct. The battle began and raged for a long time. Hundreds of gene stealers died, piling up one on top of each other. Eventually, the horde's numbers were spent in their attack. Several ultramarine terminators had been killed as their armor was torn open by the inhumanely sharp, and sharp claws of the gene stealers. The remainder of the Astartes moved further into the crypt without encountering more of the creatures. Deep beneath the city of Lomas, they found a huge cavern where the huge and bloated great-grandfather of the brood, the powerful gene Seater patriarch, sat. As the Terminators approach, another horde of gene stealers intent on protecting their alien master attacked the Terminators from out of nowhere. Storm bolters rang out, resulting in pure carnage. The company librarian fought his way to the dice, but the patriarch used psychic powers to attack the space marine psyker. A surge from the Astarte Psyche Hood broke the spell, and the librarian forced his body out of the real world for an instant, and then he reappeared, teleported on the days. The creature lashed out, and blood and sparks flew from the librarian, but the patriarch easily parried the return blow. The librarian called on his battle brothers for assistance, and the days were swept with bolter fire. Some shells pierced the power armor of the librarian but the Patriarch was also wounded. The Librarian used this opportunity to strike with his Force Axe. The Librarian's own physic psychic power behind the blow allowing the weapon to tear through the tough hide of the Patriarch. The Patriarch was dead, suddenly leaving the Brood and the entire revolution leaderless and unconnected by the cult's Brood mind. The revolution felt the death of its leader, and losses in Pentus in cohesion. The remaining Terminators slew the rest of the Gene Stealers, and the battle above slowly stopped as the revolutionaries could only retrench themselves and no longer act in a fully coordinated manner without the Patriarch's subtle psychic guidance over the cult. Small groups of Brotherhood Acolyte hybrids and Neophyte hybrids held their positions in bunkers and towers but were soon destroyed by the tanks and heavy fighting vehicles of the Astra Militarum. Icar IV was back under the control of the Imperium, and all remnants of the Gene Stealer cult, the Gene Stealers, their hybrids, infected humans, cult members and traitors, were ruthlessly wiped out. Inquisitor Agmar, leading the Ultramarines, methodically purged the planet, which eventually returned to normal. There were still questions that remained unanswered. One was the fate of the human leader of the Brotherhood, as his body was never found. The second was that the planet's astropaths had reported a shift in the warp, distant still, but the oldest of the astropaths 
had sent the psychic call of the Gene Sealer Patriarch radiating out into space and felt the change in the warp. He had sent something vast and shadowy, a monstrous entity which had turned his attention towards Ikar 4. High Fleet Kraken. The Kraken comes. The horror stories that attended High Fleet Kraken's coming to Imperial space were numerous. Among the many tragedies of this time were the following. In the middle system, Astra Militarum Regiment and the Space Marines of the Sites of the Emperor chapter held out against the Tyranids of High Fleet Kraken, who had overrun the lush jungles and plantations of Miral Prime. The Imperial forces retreated to a huge myth, mesa called the Giant's Coffin, where they defended against the vicious hordes of Xenos that infested the dense jungles below. The floral the flora of Miral itself had become mutated since the first mycetic spores of High Fleet Kraken had fallen on the world, and eventually only constant defoliation with flamers prevented the tyranid spore-infected creepers from engulfing the giant's coffin. A rogue trader brought rumors of the feral world of Larnaron to the Imperium's heart, a planet that had come to be ruled by the Celebrants of Nihilism, a heretical doomsday cult whose adherents had taken care to match their prophecies with the dire events of the time. When elements of High Fleet Kraken arrived at Larnor, nearly 75% of the planet's population had calmly marched towards the Tyranid bioships to be consumed by their new gods. The rogue trader also brought a tale from the giant asteroid monastery of Salem, which told how the ecclesiarchy monks there had chosen to poison both themselves and their carefully terraformed ecosystem rather than allow all to be consumed by the great devourer. Another dedicated imperial merchant captain helped evacuate millions of imperial citizens from the mining world of the Divian system before it was consumed. Davian's extensive systems of Nova Storm space stations held the High Fleet at bay long enough for a fleet of giant ore freighters to escape into the warp. A company of space marines of the Lamenters chapter held off the attacks of the Tyranid warriors until their last starships, or starship, had been loaded, though the space marines in the end sacrificed their own lives so that many more might live. Even those who fled successfully found little respite from the horror. One of the giant ore freighters fleeing Davion arrived at the world of Adr's Hope, ominously dark and silent. Those investigating the ship's automated landing discovered that within lay a blood trench abattoir where thousands of refugees, men, women, and children, had been mercilessly butchered by a Tyranid organism that had breached the starship's quarantine even as it fled. Only three solar weeks later, Art's hope itself was the blood-soaked ruin of a world. The Great Devourer had claimed even more victims. Seen on a galactic scale, High Fleet Kraken was attacking across a front that covered thousands of light years. Some worlds were bypassed, isolated by the High Fleet's shadow in the warp, or attacked unexpectedly, making a cohesion imperial defense almost impossible to mount. The Imperium was forced to concentrate its forces on the most strategic important forge worlds and hive worlds, while it evacuated or simply abandoned to their horrific fate many others. Still, there were some bright moments for the Imperium. Several Space Marine chapters dedicated their forces to saving worlds than the wider armies of the Astra Militarum had abandoned. Some, such as the Lamenters on the sites of the Emperor, found their once proud chapters reduced to a few scattered remains as the price of their valor, while the Knights of Eternity chapters presumed to have been completely obliterated. Others carried the battle to the Tyranids as only the Space Marines can strike the isolated tendrils of the Kraken, boarding hive ships and blowing them apart from inside. Yet no matter the efforts of the Imperium, the Tyranids were too numerous and drove ever deeper into the galaxy, towards the heart of the Imperium of Man. Battle of Icar IV Fortunately for humanity, High Fleet Kraken did not remain divided into separate tendrils indefinitely and eventually began to coalesce into a single, massive swarm on Icar IV, 
The hive world, whose large gene seeder cult infestation, had been the initial harbinger of the Kraken's arrival in the Milky Way galaxy. As the Tyranids approached the planet, thousands of gene stealers and the hybrid offsprings of the Brotherhood suddenly burst from the underhives in support of the invading Xenos, giving the lie to claims that the alien infestation had been entirely purged years earlier. The defense parameters were completely overrun, Astra Militarum troops slain by the thousands. In terrible confusion, an even larger number of Tyranid organisms made planetfall. Not only the Termagons or, and Gargoyles that had composed the vanguard of the prior assault, but truly monstrous Carnifexes and Tyrannofexes as well. Worse still, gigantic Hyrodu and Hierophant Biotitans stalked across the surface of the beleaguered world. The Tyranids had unleashed on Icor 4 every terrible organic weapon in their arsenal. Despite all this, Icor 4 was not yet lost to humanity. Forewarned of Tyranid interest in the world by the previous Gene Seeder cult infestation, the Imperium was able to mount a more solid defense in the Icar system than in other areas of the eastern fringes under assault by High Fleet Kraken. Chapter Master Marneus Kalgar, the Lord of Ultramar and the hero of the First Tyrannic War, led the Ultramarines into battle against their old foe on Icar 4, just as he had against High Fleet Behemoth on Macrog. 2,200 Terran years earlier. The Ultramarines inflicted crushing losses on the Terranid Armada in space above the planet and in the claustrophobic corridors of the towering Iker Hive cities. Space Marine Tyrannic War veterans of the First Tyrannic War made planetfall and scoured Iker Force hives in a series of close quarter battles that lasted for close to a full Terran year. By employing the same tactics that had proved successful in defeating High Fleet Behemoth and Ultramar two centuries earlier, Marneus Kalgar rallied the Imperial defenders on Icar IV and cast the Tyranids from the planet forevermore. But as always, victory against the Tyranids had come at a terrible price. Icar IV was reduced to a smoking charnel house of death and destruction. A world and its people sacrificed so that the Imperium of Man might endure yet another storm. Battle of Randnar The Justus regiments are regiments of the Astra Militarum, raised on the civilized world of Justus. Collectively known as the Emperor's Shield, these regiments are known to be highly decorated. Following fighting against the Tyranids from High Fleet Kraken on Icar IV, Imperial forces, including a Justus regiment, were redeployed to the nearby hive world of Radnar. The area around Yormal Hive was filled with Tyranid nests. Imperial forces surrounded Yormal Hive and a six solar week bombardment was commenced. The Emperor's Shield Regiment massed its armored company, which included Hellhounds and flamer equipped Lemon Rust Demolishers. The tanks, in close formation, destroyed the nest and killed any Tyranid that emerged eventually shattering their link to the hive mind. The remaining Tyranids were heralded to the far side of the hive site and easily destroyed. Assault on Yad Yandin The first warning the craft world Eldar of Yandin had of the danger possessed by the Tyranids of High Fleet Kraken was brought in 992 of the 31st millennium by the craft world's far roaming rangers those Asuriani whose instincts drive them to a life of exploration and danger, and who secretly monitor the planets and alien races near their craft world. The news that the rangers brought was, a ter was terrible indeed. A Tyranid high fleet of immense proportions was heading towards Aiaiden craft world. Already over a dozen Imperial planets had been consumed by the Tyranids' advance, and although the human Imperium was mounting furious counterattacks where possible, it would be months until a, late, until a major Imperial task force could be fully mobilized to deal with the threat. By the time the Imperial front line frontier was stabilized, the Asuriani of Yarden knew that their precious craft role would have been overrun. Farseer Kelmon, political leader and spiritual head of the craft world, called together the Asuriani of the pla of their craft world and warned them of the impending Tyranid assault. Each Aldari craft world has a great hall 
known as the Palace, the Place of Answering, which is capable of holding every member of the Craft World's population. At times of emergency, the Craft World Eldar meet there, so that all may know of the peril that face their Craft World, and so that any Asuriani might f voice an opinion on the course of action that should be taken. Only once all views had been debated and consensus reached, would the craft world's farseers decide on the course of action to be taken. The debate by the people of this craft world on the action to take against High Fleet's Kraken's approach was seated and prolonged. The more conservative elements of the craft world argued for a policy of isolation, shielding the craft world behind the powerful psychic shield in an attempt to avoid all contact with the Tyranids. The more aggressive elements wanted to attack the Tyranids immediately, dispatching the fleet to destroy the Tyranids before they reached the craft world. Both courses of actions were problematic, however, because they took no account of the sheer size of the Tyranid Hive Fleet. It took a powerful speech from the ranger Illyrith, I think I said that right, who had seen the Hive Fleet at first hand and understood the terrible threat that it represented to sway the assembled Asuriani. For over a solar hour she drove home to all present that it would take the combined efforts of every Eldari on this craft world to have any chance of turning back the Tyranids. Even then they might not succeed in defeating the alien menace. A hush fell on the halls as the ranger finished her speech. No more needed to be said, for all the Asuriani present now realized the sheer enormity of the task ahead. Farseer Kelmon rose and ordered that the Eldari prepared the defenses of the craft world. All elements of the fleet would be recalled and every single Eldar must take on a warrior aspect of warlock guardian or aspect warrior. That's kind of weird. For the first time in Eldari history since the fall, the entire craft world would be fortified, for there could be no doubt that the Tyranids would breach their outer defenses and land on the immense world ship. Help must be requested, requested from the other Asuriani craft worlds. The Avatar, the embodied spirit of the craft world's war god, Kahela Menshakain, must be awakened to take part in the battle. And most terrible of all, all of the craft world's ancient spirit stones must be plucked from their resting place and implanted in, in a cybernetic exoskeleton to battle as ghost warriors. As many Imperial scholars know, when an Eldar of the Asuriani kindred dies, their spirit is released into a gem known as a spirit stone, which is crafted into the very structure of their craft world to preserve the dead Eldar's consciousness and prevent it from migrating into the warp where it will be devoured by the chaos god Slanesh. Thus, each craft world is actually a living, intelligent being which preserves a little of the once great Eldar civilization. By risking the destruction of their craft world spirit stones, Kyomon risked the destruction of the craft world's culture, racial memory, and literally the souls of his people. It was a grave chance to take, but Kyomon knew that the ghost warriors could make the difference between victory and defeat and the struggle that was coming. The first Tyranid Hive Swarm attacked the craft world just 20 solar days later. By then, the craft world had already been isolated for over a solar week by the hive mind's shadow in the warp, which made it extremely difficult for the other Asuriani craft worlds to send help through the webway, or psychically communicate with their brethren. Apart from a few scattered units that made it through, the craft world ultimately fought the Tyranids on its own. Nonetheless, the first Tyranid waves were dealt with easily and efficiently by the Eldar fleet. The Eldar spacecraft were faster and more maneuverable and had longer range weapons than their opponents. In battle after battle, the Eldar spacecraft destroyed the lumbering biomechanical Tyranid hive ships, while only suffering minimal casualties themselves. For a while, it looked as if the Eldar fleet might be able to hold off the Tyranids on its own, as wave after wave of Tyranids were wiped out. But Forrester Kelmon was not convinced. Already, the ability of the craft world's Wraithbone forges to replace the destroyed Eldari spacecraft was being far outstripped by the casualties being suffered in the deep space battles that raged around the craft world. The Eldar fleet was being ground down in a massive battle of attrition, a battle that only the Tyranids, with their vastly superior numbers, could hope to win. 
As if to confirm Kelmon's worst fears, the next Tyranid wave attack was massive, very nearly twice the size of any that had hit the craft world so far. The Eldari fleet suffered terrible casualties in its attempt to hold the Tyranids off, and for the first time was unable to stop them from landing on the craft world itself. Although the landing was wiped out before any serious damage was done to the craft world's defenses, the Eldar fleet as large-scale fighting force had ceased to exist. Still, there was hope, especially if the wave had represented the Tyranid High Fleet's main assault force. The Eldar's morale was raised even more as the next Tyranid wave turned out to be tiny in comparison to what had come earlier. Although the weakened Eldar fleet could keep all of the swarms away from the craft world, the landings that were made were easily isolated and destroyed. For a short while, it seemed that the Eldar had weathered a terrible storm of High Fleet Kraken. Then, the craft world was hit by two huge Tyranid attacks in rapid succession. The pitiful remnants of the Eldar fleet opposed the Hive Swarms as best they could, but were ultimately swept aside by a tide of living alien spacecraft. The craft role was also but engulfed as the horde after horde of Tyranid warriors, gene sealers, gaunts, and carnifexes were disgorged onto the craft world's surface and interior. Huge battles erupted all over the craft world, the fighting bitter in close range with enemy forces often only separated by the width of a corridor of wraithbone walls, as the Eldar desperately attempted to beat off the alien invasion. Often they succeeded, but the Fortress of Tears, the Shrine of Asurian, and most terrible of all, the Ancient Forest of Silence, repositories of the flora and fauna of the lost Eldar's Empire's homeworld on the craft world, all fell to the Tyranid hordes. The Eldar furiously counterattacked the raging figure of the Avatar of Cain, leading the craft world's aspect warriors, guardians, and wraith guards and wraith lords ghost warriors in a berserk orgy of destruction, which recaptured the fortress, the forest of Tear of Silence from the Tyranids. It is said that the Eldar warriors wept tears of rage and sorrow to see the damage inflicted on the ancient forest domes of their craft world. Slowly, the Eldar managed to turn the tide on the Tyranids and gain the upper hand, forcing them back on the defensive. And then another huge Tyranid wave arrived, the third in succession and the largest yet. As swarm after swarm flickered into existence on the Eldar scanners, Kelmo knew that, barring a miracle, the craft world was doomed. Over 50 Terran years before the Tyranid assault, Hive Admi High Admiral Eriel, an Autrog that had led the craft world fleet, although he was considered one of the greatest Eldar naval tacticians to ever have lived his character was flawed by the sin of pride. When the craft world had been threatened by a chaos space fleet raiding out of the Eye of Terror, Iriel had led the Eldar fleet on a preemptive attack on the chaos fleet's flagship, leaving the craft world unprotected. He only returned just in time to stop a suicide attack by a small flotilla of chaos raider ships, when, nonetheless, who nonetheless managed to damage the craft world. Expecting to be feted and honored for his victory, Iriel was deeply angered when he was called upon to defend his course of action, claiming that his record should speak for itself. Iriel refused to enter into debate, leaving his old friend Farseer Kelmon no choice but to elect a new High Admiral in his place. Bitter with rage, Iriel had vowed that he would never set foot on the craft world again. He and a small band of followers left the craft world to pursue the path of the outcast, and formed an Eldari Corsair company known as the Eldritch Raiders that became the single most powerful Eldar pirate force operating in the galaxy. Yet when he heard of Five Fleet Kraken's assault on the craft world, Prince Eriel did his best to ignore the terrible peril that threatened his old craft world. But proud though he was, righteously angry that he remained, Eriel could not leave the craft world's people to their fate in this. Their darkest hour, in their darkest hour. Battling his way through the Tyranid's psychic blockade, Iriel swept to the aid of his people and arrived just in time. Like a thunderbolt from the blue Iriel and his large Eldari raider 
fleet smashed into the swarm of Tyranid vessels. He was quickly joined by a few remaining crafts of the Craft World's fleet, and together the combined Ad Eldar space fleet tore the swarms of High Fleet Kraken apart. Two more waves of Tyranids' hive swarms from the Kraken attacked the Craft World, only to meet the same fate. Not a single Tyranid bioship reached the Craft World, though the cost of Erio's Eldritch Raiders was dear. Bloodied but unbowed, the, the raiders prepared to sell their lives to the last in order to turn back the next wave of Tyranids. On the bridges of the craft world and on the circling Eldar starships, Vigil vigilant eyes watched the scanners, waiting for the first telltale blip that would indi indicate the direction of the next assault. Minutes passed, then hours, and with a growing sense of wonder, the Eldar realized that no more Tyranid swarms were coming. The assault was over. High Fleet Kraken had been dispersed. Its coherence had been destroyed. But on the craft world, the war raged on. The Tyranid horde that had been fighting a tenacious rearguard action, awaiting the aid of the rest of the High Fleet, now turned like cor cornered rats and hurled themselves at the Eldar. Caught by surprise, the Asuriani staggered back, desperately trying to hold in the face of the suicidal Tyranid onslaught. The forest, the fortress of the Red Moon fell to a surprise attack, and for a moment it seemed that with victory within their grasp, the Eldar would yet be defeated. But for a second time, Iriel led his Elder Raiders to the rescue of the craft world. Disembarking from their orbital spacecraft, the Raiders joined with the battered defenders of the craft world and, meter by meter, step by step, forced the Tyranids back. A final charge led by the Tyranid Hive Tyrant was annihilated by the combined efforts of the Avatar of Cain, Prince Erio, and the Ghost Warriors. And then a series of vicious, one-sided battles, the last of the Tyranids were hunted down and destroyed. The Tyranids had been defeated. But the victory was a hollow one. Though the Craft World Eldar had repulsed the invaders, the cost was enormous. Their once proud craft world stood in ruins, and four-fifths of the inhabitants were dead, or laying dead in its shattered halls. Amongst their numbers lay Farseer Kelmon, surrounded by the bodies of a dozen Tyranid zone tropes, whose wretched heads bore the marks of psychic fire. The craft world's mighty space fleet was pitiful, was a pitiful shadow of its former self. The blasted remains of its majestic spacecraft and their brave crews hanging silent and weightless in space. But all this could be rebuilt. Maybe not for hundreds of Eldar generations. But one day, in the distant future. What was lost forever were the souls of the Asurians whose spirit stones had been destroyed in battle against the Tyranids. The massive destruction wrought upon the people and the ghost warriors of the craft world dealt it and the entire Eldar species, a blow from which its culture can never fully recover. Defeat of the Kraken High Fleet Kraken was little more than a splintered fragment of its former might, yet credit could not lie entirely with the Assyrian defenders of their craft world, nor the actions of the Ultramarines on Icor IV. The craft world Eldar and the Imperium had fought as unwitting allies. Had the Kraken not struck uh, the craft world, the Ultramarine's victory at Icor IV would not have been impossible. Would not have been impossible, and vice versa. That's weird. Had either Iker IV or the Craft World fallen, the Kraken would have proven unstoppable. The scattered remnants of the Tyranid attack on Iker IV fled towards the galactic core, driving within the Imperial Defense perimeters that had been erected against High Fleet Kraken. These splinter fleets became an even greater threat to the Imperium as they fed upon unsuspecting and poorly defended worlds far from the main tyrannic war zones in the eastern fringes of the galaxy. Running battles with these Kraken splinter fleets continued for many years after the High Fleet's passage, draining Imperial defenses against later Tyranid incursions. It is doubtful if the true extent of the devastation wrought by the Kraken will ever be known to the adepts of the Administratum. The Splinter Fleets are compromised by as few as a dozen hive ships, but even as a dozen of these living vessels are more than capable of overrunning a human world and harvesting its biomass so that it may become an even greater threat. 
Some Kraken splinter fleets have become so large that through, their, through this method as to be classified by the Imperium as a new, distinct high fleet of its own. Indeed, High Fleet Megalodon grew from one of the splinters of the Kraken and continues to ravage portions of the Imperium in the present. With no doubt, the Tyranids as a whole have learned much of the Imperium's inner defenses from the actions of these splinter fleets. Every battle the Tyranids engage in, regardless of the outcome, adds to the Hive Mind's growing understanding of its new prey's behavior and tactics. And they perhaps have been the true reason for the High Fleet Kraken's existence to test Imperial defenses for the far larger Tyranid invasion of the Milky Way galaxy that is to come. If such strategic brilliance is a hallmark of the hive mind, then humanity, indeed, all the intelligent races of the galaxy, have much to fear in the coming days. The Imperium barely had time to breed following the, se the end of the Second Tyrannic War before it learned that both High Fleet Behemoth and Kraken had been little more than reconnaissance forces, for the true threat to the very existence of humanity, the arrival of High Fleet Leviathan. And then there's the Damocles Gulf Campaign. In 991, an outer wing of High Fleet Kraken approached the Damocles Gulf and destroyed a Tau exploration vessel in the region the Xenos termed the Core World Marches. The vessel managed to deploy a courier drone before self-destructing, which made the Tau Empire, which made it made the Tau Empire and alerted it to the threat approximately 18 solar months later. In response, the Tau aborted a nearly successful invasion of the strategically important Imperial planet Quadrivia, offering an alliance against the oncoming Tyranids to the local Imperial forces, under the command of Lord General Zyvan. The Imperium accepted the truce and provided Astropaths to serve aboard Tau vessels to coordinate the wider defenses of the, Mo of the Democles Gulf. Damocles. While the Tau moved to reinforce the border planet, I can't pronounce that, close to the main High Fleet's course, an Imperial task force compromising approximately 100 warships under Admiral Bourne and several Astra Militarum regiments under Zyvan, including at least one from the Krieg Death Corps, gathered at the strategic forge world Fecundia, located further off the Tyranid's course joining local Skitari and a small garrison from the Reclaimer's Space Marine chapter. The rest of the battle fleet Democles was to intercept the bulk of the fleet at Quadravavia. After defeating the first wave of Tyranids, the forces at Fecundia realized that the hive mind wished to destroy a fragment of a hive ship from a rival brood that had been recovered by the Adeptus Mechanicus from Nuscum whatever, I can't pronounce that either. Around, they found something and the, the hive ships wanted it. Okay. In the process, they learned that the Magos Kildhar, a senior Mechanicus of official, had been implanted by a gene stealer aboard the Space Hulk Spawn of Damnation at some point after 929. Commissar Sophia Kane was forced to shoot her dead with his last pistol. While the planetary government began genetic screening for additional gene stealer implantees, Fecundia came under a renewed attack by the High Fleet, still targeting the bioship fragment under the Mechanicus headquarters. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Imperials were forced to release a cache of frozen Tyranids recovered with bioship fragments as a diversion. Realizing from this behavior that the two complete competing Hive Minds were partially neutralizing each other, the Imperials hit on using a Psyker to amplify the bioship's signal. Astroplat Clementine Dre gave her life for the operation, which destabilized the High Fleet's command and control, and gave the upper hand to the Imperial Navy, which destroyed multiple escort ships and a hive ship at the heart of the fleet, forcing the Xenos into full retreat. In the wake of the invasion, the Astra Militarum established a permanent garrison on Fecundia to supplement the native Skitari, and by the 58th year of the 42nd millennium, with no confirmed Tyranid sightings for three solar decades, the planet had been officially declared cleansed. <laughs>